currently I am on the competition team training with my gym at CrossFit Invoke. And we're all in the same program, which is really exciting. We walk in, you know, I walk in, do a nice dynamic warm up. I activate the glutes because that's something that I like to do. Um, and I'll do some Olympic lifting. So light or medium weight lifts to work on technique and speed. And then I'll move to a heavy lift, like a back squat or a deadlift, one of the primary squat, press, or deadlift. And um, from there, I'll do some sort of Metcon. So I'll do two or three items that I rotate through. Uh, intensity depends, depends on where I am in my training that week. And then I, do a, I finish up with a small gymnastics skill set or uh, additional kind of cardio. This isn't as traditional as my, this isn't reflective on the programs that I write for the masses, but it is reflective of a high level competitor training. So it takes me, I don't like to be in there for more than an hour, but it usually takes me two hours right now. (laughs) Oh, nice. So you are getting back into competing. I am. And I've been really hesitant to, to talk about it because I'm, I'm just putting no pressure on myself right now. Sure. And sure. I'm enjoying the training again, which I'm so excited about. Uh, and I want to continue to enjoy it. And as soon as I'm not enjoying it or in a way that is destructive to other things in my life, then I'll kind of back off of it. But I needed to step away for a little while to to put my body back in put, like a good position and to clean out the clutter in my mind. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lionheart Radio. We are currently in the beginning stages of summer, and it doesn't matter if you are a gym rat, or a weekend warrior, or an endurance athlete, or some combination of all of them, kind of like myself, everybody has one thing on their mind, and that is looking good naked. Everybody wants to look good and have some uh, payoff for all the hard work that they're doing behind the scenes. Everybody at Lionheart Radio is no different from the host to the people that we have working behind the scenes. Now, if there is one thing that separates us apart, it's essentially the fact that we are not willing to sell you any bullshit. So what we've done is we've taken out the whole crash diet. We've saved you the, you know, six weeks to the next six pack plan. And we've taken all of the knowledge that we have collectively pooled it together and put it in a document, a book that you can download for free on lionheartrad.io. In that book, we have things that are going to help you get sustainably lean. We've got which workouts will help you burn more fat. We have tips on how to keep track of your daily calories and nutrition. And we've even got a glossary in the back with a list of movements and how you can plug them into your programming when you are looking for a desired result. Now, just like the show, everything is free. Go to lionheartrad.io and download your free ebook. As always, thank you for taking this journey with us. We will see you in the gym or at the beach. Uh. All right, well, welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lou Aviv in San Diego, California. And my guest today is Christmas Abbott. She is the founder of CrossFit Invoke multiple times CrossFit Games athlete. She's the author of The Badass Body Diet and the awaited book, The Badass Life, 30 Amazing Days to a Lifetime of Great Habits, Body, Mind, and Spirit. And she's also the first female pit crew member for NASCAR, which is pretty badass. So Christmas, thanks thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. (laughs) So if anybody has spent even a second around CrossFit in the last decade, I'm sure they're going to be familiar with uh, who you are, but a lot of our listeners are kind of like endurance athletes, and we have a lot of power lifters and that kind of a thing. Uh, So I'm wondering if you could take us back to like why you got into fitness in the first place, like kind of what your background was. Yeah, uh, my background was a rock and roller. Like (laughs) I was, I was an original rebel. So I was a smoker, partier, lots of drinking, lots of drugs. I was not in the fitness and health and wellness space until uh, early 20s, which uh, so 22, I took a job working in Iraq. And a war zone will help put things into perspective for you. And that, for me, made me realize that all of the decisions that I had made up to that point was either being a victim of my own circumstances 
or just a poor choice on my half because I didn't believe that I was worthy of something better. So I decided to start making better choices. And that wasn't necessarily, sometimes it's the lesser of the two evils, right? Sure. Um, so I quit smoking. I started to run on an ellipt elliptical and, you know, people laugh about the elliptical, but for me it was a gateway. You know, I had to find something that was challenging for me, which it was, <laughs> but not, so overwhelming that I felt like I was going to fail every day. Yeah. And so the elliptical is like the fitness marijuana. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Maybe the fitness cigarette. Not quite. <laughs> I don't think it quite was as potent as marijuana. Yeah, it's not that um, cool either. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Sorry. Uh, but it was, it was fun. And so for the first time, I committed to myself. I made a commitment and I didn't make it too terribly difficult. I just needed to do something. And that was the elliptical three times a week for a month. And I felt so much better almost immediately that I caught the bug. I was like, okay, well, what else can I do? If, if this is making me feel good, then I want more of it. And it was the first time in my life that I had made a positive decision and I felt proud of my actions. Um, so from there, I just kind of started to get curious about what else was out there. And very shortly afterwards, because of my ADD, and I started to get bored with my routine, and somebody introduced me to CrossFit and said, you're going to love this. And I had no idea what they were talking about. I was like, Cross what? I couldn't even say the word. Um, what year was this? This was 2000, and I went uh, 2005, I found CrossFit. Okay, cool. Yeah. Five? Yeah. As an, I'm an old timer. Yeah, OG. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And once I found that, I was like, well, this is exactly what I want. And it's a lot of fun. And I just kind of kept that mentality of keep it fun. So if you can like remember back, what do you think that like very first catalyst to like start making better choices was? I, I just, I really, I didn't like where I was and I didn't like where I was going and I didn't like myself. And there's a time where you say, when is enough enough? Well, you know, when you're just miserable throughout your life, no matter how wonderful your blessings are, you can't appreciate them, mm -hmm. then it's up to you to start making changes. So I just looked around and I was like, what am I doing with myself? Why am I here? I was completely lost and without any direction and not even knowing where I wanted to go. So I just, I thought, okay, I'm going to quit smoking, eat some grilled chicken and try this elliptical thing. <laughs> and We'll just start trying. I just wanted to start trying things to see, to have that, what I call an educated experience, um, and to be able to have an opinion of them. And then that'll kind of dictate where I go next. Yeah, sure. And then, yeah, that's actually really interesting because a lot of times people, when they ask me, like, you know, they're kind of like looking for that next thing or trying to figure out what it is, you know, maybe they love or they're passionate about. Oftentimes, I think the most important thing you can do is just take a step forward. Right. And just yeah, see just what's start. in front of you. Right. I agree 100 percent. Most people want to know what they're going to be passionate about without actually trying it. And that's kind of detrimental in the same way that you have an opinion about an experience of something without actually trying it. That would be negative. So saying I know I won't like that is setting you, yourself up for a limited experience. And, and you could, I mean, all the things that I thought I was going to hate or was terrified of, I actually ended up loving and really enjoying. So I always advocate to people to not um, get in their head and predict what their experience will be, but rather just take a chance on themselves and go try it and then have that real life experience. And then they have an educated opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I think the less bias uh, that you can go into a situation with, the more easily you'll be able to see what kind of resonates with you within those situations, right? And exactly. And what's beautiful about this is that you're going to, if you go into something with like, okay, I'm just going to take this experience as it is, then you actually get to take so much more away because you're open to the experience versus trying to dictate what it's going to be for you because you have these preset conceptions. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really good advice. And we're going to, I'm going to try not to do too many like hard up advice so that we can save that for the final question. Okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, no, it's great though. Um, so 
you have done a really good job at like staying lean all year round. And right now we're in a period of the season where we're like heading into that summertime and everybody is really concerned with staying lean, right? Whether they're athletic or not, uh, that's something that people definitely care about going into this season. So I kind of want to know what, what kind of principles do you have? What, what are the principles behind your approach to your diet? You know, I don't really think about whether or not I need to lean out or, you know, it just, I want to eat for what I, my lifestyle is during that time. Meaning that if I'm training more, I'm eating more and I'm eating heavier things. Um, if I'm training less, then I'm going to eat lighter things. But, and I think that especially in, specifically in CrossFit, um, and a few other sports, we put too much emphasis on that leanness versus on a healthy body composition. We need body fat. We, we become stupid and mean without it. <laughs> so, and, and, and not as powerful or as fast. So we, I advocate for people to, Hey, look, you don't need single digit body fat. You're going to be stupid. <laughs> and I say this like absolutely politically incorrect. Um, sure. so for, for me, I advocate for people to eat well, supporting their lifestyle and that will support them in a positive way versus restrict them and make them feel miserable. Because if you hate your diet, you're not going to stick with it. So I eat a consistent way throughout the year. And then I just up my food intake when I up my training. Mm. But so what the Badass Body Diet, your first book, what, would that be geared toward people that already kind of have a handle on macros and some of the other you know, basic nutritional approaches then? Um, no, uh, what that is geared towards is everybody and it gets to be specific. So if you are, if you are wanting to dial things in really, really closely, it gives you that opportunity to learn how to do that. But the, the overarching theme of the book and message is that everybody can eat well for their body type and that body type will vary from person to person and it doesn't have to be perfect, but it teaches you about what macronutrients are and how they are utilized together every meal to give you the best hormonal balance, which is going to show up in your sleep, your performance, and your body composition. Hmm. So do you advocate using or eating a lot of fat in order to uh, kind of uh, support that hormonal balance? Uh, I advocate eating a balance of a protein, a carbohydrate with a dash of fat, every meal or snack. I mm -hmm. don't advocate just macro loading, meaning that with I'm fitted into my macros for a day that, that takes away the balance of the trifecta, which are the three macronutrients, um, for you consuming it hormonally at one time. So if you think about food as in a drug, which it is, each of the macronutrients are their independent drugs. And together, they work best when consumed at the same time. So if it fits your macros, you can eat all of your carbs in the morning. And then you, first thing in the morning, you offset your hormonal balance. And you're kind of on this yo-yo all day long, even though perception says that, or like, uh, the if it fits your macros states that, you can eat it whenever throughout the day, as long as you get it in that day, mm -hmm. where I'm saying you need to balance it between every meal and then have these other two macros with it, no matter what. Uh, I think that will help um, body composition be more consistent and emotional balance is more consistent because you're not putting your hormones through a yo-yo. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And that's actually something like we really wanted to, I wanted to try to highlight in this episode, because like I said, you kind of, you seem to have it figured out where you're, you stay at a decent level, because you do some fitness modeling and things like that. So you stay at a decent <laughs> leanness all year round. And a lot of times people tend to kind of hit the crash diets right before, right before the summer or, you know, Halloween or sometimes yeah. when it matters. I, you know, my, the reason I say the like I do is because I have consistently been working this program for almost 10 years, you know, for about 10 years, uh, give or take. And so my body has just become consistent with this composition. It's not, I'm not restricting myself. I'm not starving myself. I'm not crash dieting. And what happens is that my metabolism has been taught to be higher burning consistently throughout the day, 
Um, and so therefore I'm just burning extra calories all the time, whether or not my training is heavy or my food intake is heavier. Um, and so that's the beautiful thing about practicing this consistently is that you will become really, really consistent with your body composition. Now, when you do these crash diets or these, these, not even a crash diet, say for example, you go on a 30 something day challenge and it's only for those 30 days. What happens is that your metabolism starts learning a new process. And then at the end of that 30 days, you return back to whatever your old eating habits were. And now it's confused and it has to relearn this process again. Over time, you will eventually start to um, really mess up the wiring of your metabolism. And it says, bitch, I'm not doing this anymore. (laughs) (laughs) And it it basically is like no more. And so it's harder to retrain it. Um, once you're back on a a good, uh, very supportive program. So I want people to know that, you know, if they've done it throughout, you know, yo-yo dieted through a couple of years, eventually their metabolism is going to shut down or slow down and stop, um, being as responsive as it was at one time. So that's a, that's a caution for the yo-yo dieting for a long-term effect. Yeah. I, I actually a hundred percent agree. I've like bounced back between, uh, endurance sports and then also like strong men. And then also did some CrossFit for a while. And, uh, I think I hit a point last year where I went back to endurance from strongman, and my body was like, you know what? Now you can just be fat. How about that? <laughs> it was like <laughs> super hard to get my metabolism to come back and like work. <laughs> yeah, exactly and i mean this is coming from you which you're you're a multi-sport athlete and you, you know what you're doing <laughs> right right and those weren't even crash diets that was simply just going through the process of gaining weight for my sport and losing weight for my sport you know exactly so going back to your kind of original journey what was the process like figuring out what worked and what didn't for you nutritionally like how did you kind of form this approach i guess I just, I started reading a lot of books there, you know, during this time, there wasn't a lot of information out there and you had to really sort through the BS and, you know, weighing the, the, the effects of having a lemonade diet versus, you know, these macronutrient balances, which was also unheard of because at this time, this was all about the no fat, low fat trend. Mm -hmm. Um, and then here I am doing some research and I'm saying, no fat's good for you. That's not fat doesn't make you fat. Um, so I got a lot of pushback on the information that I found and I, you know, kind of like CrossFit where they Frankenstein all of these amazing movements that are very effective. I did the same thing for my diet regimen. So I was my own Guinea pig. Hmm. I tested things. I, I decided, you know, I decided, um, to record how I felt about them physically and how I felt about it emotionally because eating things that help me physically doesn't always help my soul. Right. <laughs> and sure. And I wanted to be able to find a balance because I'm a natural foodie. I love food. I'm a Southern girl and I like, you know, comfort food. So I needed something that was beyond just super clean and, you know, the most perfect for me. I was like, this is great, but I'm not going to eat this forever. And you're going to get a salad toss at your head if you keep offering me this. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just, I went through a whole bunch. I tried a whole bunch of different programs and I took what I liked about certain programs and left what I didn't like or didn't apply to me and, um, came up with this. And then my people, my followers and fans started asking about them. And that's how I came up with the different body types because it, it was, mine was different than theirs and they wanted something that would help them. So really it was just through the process of guinea pigging. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely makes sense. Um, I don't know how often you use the word salad and toss in the same sentence, but it's throwing me off right now. <laughs> um, let me get back on track. <laughs> so when you are, uh, when people are reading your book, how are they kind of, or how are you accounting for maybe individual differences and in things that, you know, for example, rice isn't going to affect you the same way that it affects me. So how do you kind of account for those different intolerances and individual differences in diet? Or do you? Um, for my first book. Yeah, sure. Or, yeah, or even your approach if it's evolved. I do. Um, so there's, there's three different categories of foods, meaning that there's like a premium quality and that's going to be like your super lean. That's your, your low glycemic index, uh, fruits and veggies 
and um, very lean meats. So like fish and poultry, that's kind of, that's the premium. So that is going to be real. If you, you can eat lots of that um, and still, you know, that's the one where you get the salad toss at the head. Cause you're like, I've had enough of this clean freaking eating. Um, and then there's the acceptable category. So that's, that's where I go into, depending on what your body type, you get X amount of percentage of this into your, um, daily consumption. Okay. So, and then the unacceptable, and that's going to be like sugars, alcohol, and, um, heavily processed foods. So you can put them into your diet, but I want you to put them as sparingly as possible and maybe even on a schedule. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for each body category, you get a certain amount of percentage of the other three food categories and you get to pick whatever foods you want. You know, I'm not going to restrict you. If you're like pasta is my thing, I'm like, great, you can have your pasta, but this is the, the category it's in and this is how much you get. Uh, and it helps people really take back control of portion control and understanding that, hey, if I want that pasta, then I need to stay in that premium category a little bit more this week. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's actually a really cool approach. I haven't really heard that before. Thanks. And I'm actually currently working on an online coach nutrition coaching program that this is exactly what we're going to do. Um, and like we're going to on ramp you. We're going to evaluate what you, your intake is and what is your goal and how much effort are you going to put into this program? And depending on that, I can calculate how long it's going to take you depending on your effort level and, um, your goal. So we're each week, I'll be able to send you a new lesson plan for you to be able to slowly understand and educate yourself on this process, but also be able to take these tools and apply it to your life to where you won't have to use the online coaching program. It's going to be called can, um, at a later date. So basically I'm working myself out of a job. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's awesome. When, when do you think that'll be available for people? Um, I am, um, I believe that it'll be, we're going to do pre-registration and, um, testing in July and, um, we should open the doors for full, uh, sign up in September, I believe. So if you want to get on that program, then you can sign up for my newsletter at christmasabbat.com and it's gonna it's this is like the biggest thing that i've ever done i'm so excited about it nice yeah we'll definitely <laughs> link that up in the show notes too. i will geek out all day about this <laughs> cool it's and, and like what's cool is that if you want you're like oh christmas i'm only going to eat 70 percent accurate We're like great um we can plug in your meal plans we can send you um, if that week you're like at 85% accuracy because it'll send you a review every week. Um, we can be like, awesome. You just bumped up your goal timeline by a day. Uh, so it's very, very results driven, um, motivation. And my biggest, fa- my biggest thing is education. It seems like it's uh, very adaptable too, which is important. Yeah. Is important. So <laughs> you, you mentioned, uh, sugar, refined sugar and alcohol sparingly. So, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> one of the things that I found though, even when I get people to eat more whole foods based or paleo based or whatever it is, if I tell them they can't have alcohol, they're going to throw the ba- the baby out with the bathwater. And my, yeah. my approach is kind of like, well, look, I'm not trying to make your life suck. <laughs> I'm trying to make you healthier. So I found it, I've, I'm better off to let them just pick different alcohol. Um, but mm. I, I'm just curious of what your approach to that is. Um, I agree. You know, one thing I, I say, well, one, it's in the unacceptable category. That doesn't mean that it's blacklisted. It just means that we want to, we want to utilize that as little as possible. But, um, and I don't do it. I usually don't even approach this in the first month. This is a later down the road where they have a good grip on their, their macros and their regiment. And they're feeling like they, they are really implementing this and have implemented it and feel strong about it. That's when I'm like, okay, let's look at your sweet intake and let's look at your alcohol intake. Um, and that, and then we're like, she's like, usually they don't want to let it go. Mm -hmm. And that's when I start asking them, usually they're like, well, how do I get rid of this patch or how do I, you know, PR on this? And I say, well, this is the last part that's holding you back. And this is your heaviest chain. Um, so I just ask them, I'm like, you know, you have to be honest with what you want. And if you want that extra, that next level, then we have to either 
reduce and eventually eliminate this, the unacceptable area. Um, or you have to accept that you are going to play in the unacceptable area and you're good with not going to the next level. Uh, so I have a very candid conversation about what they truly want. And usually they're not ready to give it up. And then I, you know, we go through challenges. I go, okay, let's do it for two weeks. Let's go two weeks, no, no sugar. Or I, I usually challenge a month, but, or two weeks, no alcohol. I assign them a cheat day, not a cheat day, a cheat item. So a cheat item is a glass of wine or a piece of cake or whatever it may be. Usually it's a single item. And I say every weekend, either Saturday or Sunday, you get two cheat items. And that's if they're being really regimented with this. This is not for not everybody. And what they will find is that eventually they don't even want them anymore because they're doing so well and they feel so good. And having that one glass just kind of doesn't give them the reward that they once received. And now they're like, okay, I, it doesn't even make me feel good anymore. I don't see the point in it. And so they actually let go of it themselves. Sure. So you kind of guide them into a place where it's almost a logical decision to let it go. And, and honestly, if you're eating well and doing it for that much of the time, you really do have a, a poor response, like physical response to that type of toxin in your body. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I mentioned um, it on this show before, but no matter what your diet is or how clean your alcohol is, it it 100% blocks your body's ability to burn fat. So you can yeah, you can only get fatter if you're drinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you put it that way, people are like, "Oh yeah, I think I can put that wine down." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Along with this with the nutritional approach, what what's your and I know right now currently for you you're kind of starting to get back into the competition phase but and, and I'm not sure if you even do recommend training for people but I'm curious if you do in order to facilitate this kind of lifestyle that you've that you've built for yourself what are your methods to to working out and how have they kind of evolved I believe that there are different approaches for training um one is the competition level which is super intense and you have to be able to have a equally aggressive recovery um, plan to be able to implement so you don't break. Um, but I think that there are, are a lot of really great gateway programs out there. So that's one thing that I specialize in with my workout programs that I do online and the challenges that I do is that I want it to be able to be done anywhere at any time and you still get a really great workout in and it's not intimidating. I want to be able to be that gateway drug for people into the fitness industry. And then you have like the second tier, which is joining a, a gym that is a regimented gym like CrossFit or weightlifting or, you know, one of these other um, named, you know, Orange Theory, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. that's almost like the next level, even though mine can parallel with it. I just think that as long as you're doing something active and fun, then you're creating a beautiful experience for yourself and you're going to continue to do it and continue to stay active and um, enjoy the process. If you are miserable in it, in a mean, in a negative way where it you dread it, you hate it during it, and then you go home feeling kind of pushed over or run down, try something different. Um, fun is, fitness is fun, and that when you enjoy it, you'll do more of it. So I tell people I don't really care what their training regimen is, as bad as that sounds, but really it's for the intention of are they getting out, are they being active, are they occasionally pushing themselves and this is for like the everyday person. And do they go home feeling good about themselves afterwards? That's what my goal is for um, teaching fitness to everybody. Yeah. I think that's uh, something that's really overlooked in CrossFit particularly is people get involved in CrossFit and then they get uh, awakened to competing in CrossFit. And when they start putting in the amount of work that it really takes to be good at competing in CrossFit, uh, they make themselves miserable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what happened to me. Is I like got into it, and I'm like, oh, dude, I'm going to the games for sure. And then yeah, watch I, out, friend. <laughs> yeah, and then when I started training six hours a day, I was like, I actually fucking hate this. I'm always in the gym, and you're always feeling broken or sore yeah. or you know, like ne it's never enough. And I I love being able to identify that there are two levels of CrossFit. There are two different styles of CrossFit. 
One is the competition CrossFit, which is we, what we see on the games and we see at regionals and we see, you know, at local competitions. Two, CrossFit was made for the masses. It was made to be that gateway experience in the highly effective, highly efficient, and just really fun because it changes every day. This is why I fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. And it was made for that everyday person to be able to experience something wonderful and unique. And I think that there, there needs to be an identification between the two levels of CrossFit and the two, the two genres that I was just talking about. And it's so frustrating where people are like, oh, no, I'm not going to do CrossFit because I'm not going to lift 300 pounds over my head. I'm like, I don't lift 300 pounds over my head. OK, <laughs> but it is like my mother. She's 60 years old. She does it. And she didn't start it until five years ago. It literally is made for everybody as long as you have a strong coach that is all about technique and safety and you you can definitely end scaling. It really is a beautiful experience. Yeah, I, I agree. I think people miss out on the context part of it, which is they don't really understand the context of why they're doing what they're doing. And it's easy yeah. to go down the wrong road, I think, when that happens. Well, I talk about that all the time, you know, know your why and it'll create a moral compass and really help make all the decisions in your life much easier. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually in the new book. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Very cool. We're going to link to that too. <laughs> how do you, how do you, and I didn't even actually plan this question, but I'm just curious because I'm, I'm interested in myself. How do you, how did you go about finding your why? Um, I didn't know it for a while and you know, even though I, I, it was under the surface, it was, I have about, I have two whys, you know, my why is to be able to live to my full potential. And when I realized that making good decisions would make a better opportunity for myself, that was like, like so clear. The other why that I have is for me to be able to share my experience so that others don't have to suffer the way that I suffered and they can see that they have the opportunity to change their lives every day they wake up and that power is within them. And so for these two reasons is, I mean, I, I'm a workaholic. I love it. There are hard days and there are great days, but my hardest day, I will never trade for my best day doing anything else. And, you know, for me, it's, it's not about competition. It's not being about being the best in the game or the strongest or the fastest. It's about being able to literally help somebody find a better path for themselves in whatever way that I can help them find that. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think that's probably one of the most uh, beneficial parts of the explosion in fitness that we've seen is that people like you are available now, which is where it's when you were coming up for your journey right? You had the elliptical and you kind of had to like really dig deep to try to figure out what worked and what didn't. Yeah. And we, you know, we had, you either did running or bodybuilding. (laughs) And I was like, I don't know. There's something, there's, there must be my body type. Where's my body type? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I always wish I could go back and get like the two decades of buys and tries I did. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) So I did a lot of buys and tries too. So yeah, (laughs) not quite two decades though. Right. Um, so you've built a really, you know, well, I'll use the word badass. You've built a really badass life for yourself, uh, both with the entrepreneur side the fitness modeling side, and then the, also the, the fitness competition side, what do you think the low hanging fruit is for people, so to speak, to kind of start making a change and start living their best self? You know, I think that the the awareness that they want something different is the first step. And then, you know, I, I'm a big schedule person. I'm a big, you know, put something on the schedule and affirm. So put something on the schedule and let people know that it's on the schedule. So now you've created a, a win and an accountability system. So n- now it's kind of just your yours to fail or yours to succeed. And, um, you know, reach out, either go to the pole dancing class or just show up. You can't make changes without making action. And everybody was a beginner. Even the most expert people started off not knowing what they know now. So everybody was embarrassed at some time. Lean into it and put it on the schedule. Tell somebody to come with you. And if they don't want to come with you, screw it. Go by yourself. Be bold. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. So <laughs> to recap, the elliptical is like smoking weed. Salad is for tossing, <laughs> and then put pole dancing classes in your schedule. I love it. Got it. <laughs> I'm saying that that's that's a pretty interesting experience. I mean, your advice, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Best what? recap in a long time. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, what do you think the biggest thing that stands in people's way when they're trying to when they're trying to better themselves? What do you think like and that can be diet wise or training wise or or lifestyle wise like what what are the big things that you see people kind of get roadblocked on and then how do you how do you help people around those? You know, I think that they want the quick fix right now. I think that they're I think most people aren't willing to trust the process and trust the system. Meaning that, you know, if they don't see, we're such a, just a quick result, instant gratification in um, society right now that we can't even watch a 10 second freaking video. We have to down it to three now. So trust the process, give yourself some time and to celebrate the small accomplishments. We are so hard on ourselves, especially women, you know, we'll, we'll be training for whatever reason and just get your first double under which is a, and people will be like, oh my gosh, that's so excited. But the person who just got it will be like, well, I could have, I should have gotten two. I'm like, bitch, can't you celebrate one? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So we we're constantly not, you know, we're, let me rephrase this. I'm getting excited and tongue tied. Um, We're not celebrating the process as it's happening and appreciating the journey as it is going on. We are constantly looking at that end goal and not stopping to see what we're having happen around us. We have to enjoy the process and trust that it's going to work. And on a long enough timeline, you know, a month, two months, three months, if it hasn't worked to your satisfaction, then you can change it. But don't change it every week just because it's not giving you that quick fix. Hmm. So I think that that is, I definitely agree. I think people get really caught up in, I think because we are in a society now or or technology has progressed to a point where we have so many inputs all the time that we're easily distracted and we're always looking because everything is so fast now. We're always looking for uh, LTE, so to speak, and 3G sucks now, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, and maybe you reminded it or maybe you answered it with how you, how you celebrate the small victories, but I'm just curious, how do you consciously remind yourself to kind of slow down and, and, and enjoy those because that's that's something I actually have trouble with too. Um, so every morning when I wake up, I do a few minutes to kind of center myself and I give gratitude. Um, whether you call it prayer, meditation, gratitude, practice, it doesn't matter. But I take a few minutes in the morning and I just I just kind of look at my life and I say, okay, what is it today that I'm grateful for? And I have to usually stop myself because there's so many things that I appreciate. But I think that if we take a scheduled out time every day to sit down and and either list or say our gratitude, we will naturally start to become more gracious of what the small accomplishments are, not just in our fitness, but our personal life too. That's awesome. Yeah, I definitely agree. How do you stay motivated to kind of keep pushing? So you've accomplished a lot and and I think a lot of times people, there's a tendency to kind of rest on your laurels. I, I hear a lot of people talk about how cool they used to be. I'm curious, how do you, how do you keep pushing? How do you stay motivated throughout, through the whole process? Um, there's lots of different, I think what I call internal motivation and external motivation. So external motivation is something that, you know, I can go read, um, fans comments or letters. That's something that is outside of myself that can give me a boost. And as no matter how amazing that boost is or motivation surge is, it's still not within me. So it's going to be very short lived. This can be like a coach influence or significant other influence, whatever it may be. It's external, external motivation. That internal motivation, I think is what you're referring to is something like once I lit my own fire and realized that I had a potential of doing something amazing with my life, then that was my steadfast motivation. And that's what kept me on track and laser focused. Now, how I kind of keep that in check is one gratitude, but in, in, you know, constantly looking back at what my struggles were, 
Um, and then also being able to think about my legacy of my life, meaning that I want to look back and say, did I do what I wanted to do in the way that I wanted to do it? And it's, it's a kind of a powerful position to think about where you start to not worry about all the bullshit and all of these small things kind of fade away where you're like, am I going to think about this in 10 years? Then why am I getting so upset? And you start making better decisions to build on that legacy that you want to leave. And it motivates you to do better things and to be able to do it in a way that chases excellence. Yeah, so it seems like you you consciously continue to remind yourself to step back and have perspective on the, on the whole experience. Yeah, and I, I think that's tied in with the gratitude, but also having a purpose for what you do, knowing your why, will give you that natural motivation. Do you have advice for people that, so right now in the age of Instagram, <laughs> everybody has a <laughs> Transformation Tuesday pick uh, and they want to start selling online programming. Uh, I'm curious, <laughs> do, do you have advice for people uh, that want to kind of create a life around the fitness industry? Because I think there's a lot more of them than, than people realize. You know, I, I have to say that a personal story, there needs to be some sort of human connection of there's power and struggle. So if you are the most fitness guru, fantastic. That sounds like a dime a dozen. But if you went through the struggle yourself and you share your story, people resonate with that. And then they believe it more. They're more likely to believe in what you're doing because you understand where they are. And that has been a huge success in my development on what Instagram and all these other experiences is because I've been in the gutter. You know, I, I had a drug issue. I had all of these challenges and I was able to overcome them and sharing that struggle is what people buy into and not saying buy into like, Oh, they're, they're buying into me, but you know, they, they have to believe that one, you are authentic and two, you know, your shit. And, uh, I believe that sharing your personal story of your why will help people really um believe you yeah from a marketing perspective uh, a personal story that's like kind of entrenched with with the typical story arc of having a, a thick plot and a and a good and a hero right it, from a marketing perspective it's it's very compelling thank you yeah <laughs> uh, so yeah it wasn't really a question i was kind of putting it out there <laughs> Uh, so what are you most excited about now? Like, cause I know you're always, uh, you're always doing new cool things. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I just get excited about, I love working. Um, and I love what I do. And like I said, it's lots of hard days. Um, but a couple things that I have in the pipeline right now is the book launches next week. Badass life. Really excited about that. And it's just an accumulation of my experiences, much like we talked about today. Um, and how to like change your mindset on things. The other thing that I'm working on is the can program. And that is an online coaching, uh, nutrition coaching program that will be launching late this summer. And then mid summer, I am launching my own supplement line, which is a, a huge focus on clean supplements. Oh, nice. Uh, and yeah. So we're, we're in the final phases of that marketing development and it should be launching. Um, I'm doing a, a private batch for the Barbella box in June. I don't know if I was supposed to say that, but that's okay. okay. And then we should be in on market in July. So those are just a few things that I have coming in and I'm just, I've, I'm doing more things that are going to reach more people versus just smaller events and, a uh, really hard hustle. <laughs> yeah, so we didn't really get into it, but with with the, your nutrition philosophy and because it's kind of a, so original, I'm curious what what is your approach to supplementation for people? Um, you know, I believe in a core four, so that is a uh, magnesium, a zinc, uh BCAA, and then a, a a fish oil. Um and then everything else is great and we can do extra stuff. Um, my line, those will be some of the key things in my line. Um, but I'm also going to be doing like an AM booster pack and a PM nightly recovery. Uh, and I'm also for all 
guys and ladies specifically, I'm um, going to do a collagen product. So something that is going to be really geared towards healthy skin and nails, but also I'm going to do a uh, gut health elixir as well. Oh, nice. That's cool. Yeah. So for that. So I'm real excited about this one. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Well, do you have a name for your, your line yet? Uh, we're waiting for the copyright, so I'm not allowed to say it yet. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, we'll go back and we'll, if you're listening to this after, uh, after it launches, we'll have it linked up. Yeah. Sorry guys. So <laughs> the Lionheart kicker is the final question and we try to ask it uh, to every guest and that is based on everything that you've done, all the experiences that you've had uh, so far in your life, and it can be training and it can be diet related. If you could give blanket advice and it were guaranteed that it would be translated to every language and everybody would hear it, uh, what would you tell people? You know, it's, it's so simple. And I would just tell people to find something that they enjoy doing, whether it's work, recreation, fitness, uh, academic, it doesn't matter. If you enjoy it and you have a developed passion about it, then run with it. Um, and it, it really gives such beauty and gratitude to your life when you have something that you can look forward to, to daily. Yeah. When you began doing that, when you began chasing what, what you're passionate about, did, were, did you experience a lot of pushback from people around you or family or, or did you everybody, out? everybody's really? like, why are you doing this? Why are you spending so much time in the gym? Why are you doing that? Why are you always on your phone? I'm like, cause it's my thing. And you have to be willing to be the exception. And the being the exception is really uncool until it isn't. <laughs> and then because then you're the exception to the rule and you get famous or popular or whatever it may be because you were willing to take that chance and stand out and be an outlier. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. It's like the Gandhi quote. It's like, first they'll, they'll fight you, then they'll laugh at you and then they'll follow you or something like that. I'm yeah. Sure yeah. You know, I think it's like, what is, I can't remember the quote exactly, but you know, one in a million, you'll uh, laugh at me if I fail, but one in a million, I'm brilliant if I succeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, that's the thing about, you know, great endeavors in life, whether it's fitness or, or whether it's business. I mean, you only have to be right once, right? Like if you, <laughs> if you look at the amount of businesses and people that have failed, like even the businesses that you look forward or you look up to, I guarantee that they have a ton of failures in the books. It's just that, you know, they kept pressing on after those failures and they, and they got, they got that win. The failures are way more than the successes and usually more known than some of the successes. Uh, so, I mean, that's the beautiful thing is I tell people that it's not failure unless you quit. It's yeah. just now you're, you learn where to pivot and what to change. And then you implement a new plan. Um, I call that successful failure. As long as you learn something from it, it is a successful failure. Right. Yeah. And I, I just, I point that out because I think as people take advice on following their passion, it's important to be kind of realistic and know like, you know, this life, if you're going to chase anything great at all, like you're going to have to shoulder some of those learning experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So for people that are listening to this uh, and they're interested in everything you're doing and they want to support your journey, how can people follow along with you? Well, um, they can sign up for my newsletter on christmasabbott.com. I get, send out what I call a weekly treat. And every week we send out a little something of uh, this motivation, uh, mental training, or just you get first dibs on all the goodies that I come out with and usually at a discounted rate. Um, otherwise you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram, which is Christmas Abbott, pretty easy to stalk. So you can find me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Findable. Okay. Uh, thank you for being on. I really appreciate you taking the time and we'll have all of that linked up in the show notes for this episode. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. 
Com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest nigga be the coldest. People